Preface of Whither Thou Goest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. Whither Thou Goest by William LeCue. Preface What This Story Is About the Earl of Saxon was vastly annoyed when his son Guy fell in love with a penniless nobody, and announced that he would marry her against all opposition. He determined to separate the lovers, to which end he persuaded an influential friend in the Foreign Office to secure an appointment for Guy in the Embassy at Madrid. He little knew that he was sending his son into the center of a hotbed of anarchism that Guy's footsteps were to be dogged by a vindictive and revengeful woman, that his life was to hold many a thrilling moment, and not a few narrow escapes. Mr. LeCue has written a thrilling story of anarchism and its deadly secret plotting, a story through which there runs, nevertheless, a rich vein of romance. Prologue A hot July evening on the calm Biscayan coast of Spain. The sun had disappeared like a globe of molten metal into the sapphire sea, and now, in the breathless blood-red afterglow which tinged the unruffled glassy waters away to the Atlantic, the whole populace of the peaceful old-world town of Fontarabia had come forth from their houses to breathe again after the intense heat and burden of the blazing day. Dusty green sun-shutters were being opened everywhere while upon the golden beach the clear waters hardly rippled, for the summer tide was upon the turn. Across the bay lay a cluster of gaily painted sardine boats in reds and greens, awaiting a breeze, and along the seafront so fiercely swept in winter stood the quaint medieval houses, crumbling and sun-blanched, with their wide overhanging roofs and many balconies palpitating with the heat, now rapidly receding. It had been a scorching day in Spain. In the stunted tamarisk which sprang, dust-covered and twisted, from the yellow shifting sands, the grasshoppers still chirped merrily, though it was sunset, and from the sun-blanched sea-front came of a sudden the high, tuneful twanging of a mandolin, and a man's tenor voice singing that ancient love-song which one hears everywhere in the winelands of the Gepushqua. Passez, contez-vous, amour, en tous, prisonne. From the houses came forth the many mixed odors of the evening senna, the appetizing smell of rich olas, mostly flavored with garlic, be it said, while from the shops which sold eatables there emanated that faint and peculiar perfume which only those who have lived in hot climates can know and can justly appreciate. Of a sudden the ancient bells of Santa Gadea the old incense-laden Gothic church above the town, clanged forth again, as they had done so many times a day through centuries, summoning the good people of Fonterabia to kneel before the high dark altar with those long candles and the wonderful brass chandelier above. Now, as the bells jangled forth, an observer might perhaps have noticed two men meet, as though entirely by accident, close to that little obscure café the Concha which faces the sea. On the pavement before the little place sat several men in their blue berets, drinking wine and gossiping as all Spaniards must do. The pair who had met were of quite different stamp. One, who was about forty, of a refined but rather parvenu type, was dressed in a well-cut suit of thin dark gray material, and wore a straw hat much ripened by the sun. He was idly smoking a long Valenciano, and betrayed surprise, though feigned, at the meeting. The other was a typical fisherman in the blue blouse and blue beret, the national headdress of all the Basque people. He still wore his heavy sea-boots, in which, however, he walked jauntily, for his age was not more than thirty, and his dark, handsome countenance was bright, enthusiastic, and well bronzed. On meeting the man of the sun-ripened straw hat, and of much superior class, turned quickly and walked beside him. As he did so, a tall Jesuit priest, a man with a swarthy, sinister face and a long, rather shabby cassock, Father Gonzalo by name, chanced to pass. 
Carlos Somoza, the fisherman, saluted him reverently, but beneath his breath he exclaimed in Spanish, "'May the Holy Madonna curse him forever!' "'Why?' inquired the man in grey, whose name was Garcia Cirilta, a native of Toledo who had come in secret from Madrid, in order to meet his fisherman friend. "'Because he may recognize you. There may be a hitch.' "'Bah! There will be no hitch. There cannot be. You people here in the country are so often faint-hearted. We in the capital are not. All goes well, and success must be ours. It is but a simple matter of waiting, waiting in patience. Yes, but Father Gonzalo is a man I do not like. Why, he looks really quite harmless. Who is he? Nobody exactly knows, was the fisherman's reply, as they turned up the narrow Cali Mayor, that old world street of high handsome houses, mostly adorned with the crumbling coats of arms of the ancient proprietors, and with balconies of wrought iron and wide projecting roofs across the narrow footway. He has been here for about four months, yet he is not attached to Santa Gadea. Sometimes he visits the sick, and all speak well of him but both Cardona and San Fuegos agree with my suspicions that he is a government agent, and that he is here to find out all he can. His companion grunted. Dios, if that is really so, then we must discover more about him, he said. I trust, however, you are wrong, for, as you say, he might recognize me again, and that would certainly be most awkward in my position as deputy governor of the province of Neva. "'Yes, Excellency, that is why I cursed him,' replied the intelligent fisherman with a smile. "'At our meeting last Thursday we discussed whether Father Gonzalo should not meet with—well, meet with an accident.' "'No, no,' replied the other quickly, raising his voice because at the moment a heavy cart, with its great wood-disc wheels drawn by two white bulls and laden with wine-barrels, rumbled past them slowly over the cobbles. "'Not here. That would never do, never.' it would upset all our plans. We must be cautious, always cautious. Watch him, and report to me in the usual way. A letter to the Posta Restante in Madrid. I will at once inquire about this mysterious father, and the reason he has come to Fonterrabia. He may, as you suspect, be an agent of the ministry in disguise. We are quite certain that he is. If so, he must not remain here, declared the stranger decisively. It would certainly be extremely dangerous for you and for all your friends. The success of our coup depends upon entire secrecy. Your little circle here have ever been loyal and undaunted. There must be no betrayal as there was, you recollect, in Barcelona before the war. Barcelona is a city, Fonterrabia is only a little town, and hence it should escape suspicion, was the educated young fisherman's remark. Ours we know to be a just and noble cause, and we, as sons of Spain, are each of us prepared willingly to sacrifice our lives if necessary. Well said, Carlos. Our gallant leader, Ferdinand Contreras, who has lately sacrificed most of his great fortune to secure the salvation of Spain, is aware of your loyalty, Zerilta assured him. A little time ago I was with him at one of our secret sessions at Toledo, and he mentioned you and your friends here and praised you for your patriotism as a true son of Spain. "'But the Englishman, what of him?' asked Carlos as, strolling slowly, they were approaching the great old church. "'That Englishman? Oh, yes, I know. You have serious and perhaps foolish apprehensions in that direction,' was the reply of the deputy governor of Neva. "'But, Carlos, you can rest assured that we shall have no real trouble from that quarter. He will die, as the others have done.' and he will die very soon. "'You are quite certain of that?' asked the fisherman eagerly. "'Quite. It is all arranged. An accident, a mystery, and nothing more,' laughed the man from Madrid. "'The Englishman is our most serious enemy,' declared Carlos, as yet only half convinced. "'One by one the enemies of our own Spanish people have been swept away. He will soon follow them, rest assured. De los enemigos los emes the fewer the enemies, the better. But he may go back to England. We discussed it all here at our secret meeting last Thursday. Well, and suppose he is in England. It does not matter. The avenging hand of our great Contreras, who may Dios protect, will strike him there, never fear. 
wherever he is, he cannot escape us. He will die, and his death will be a mystery to the English police, as so many deaths have been. At that moment the pair found themselves passing the great old Gothic door of Santa Gadea, which the sacristan had thrown open to the air for an hour to clear the atmosphere of incense before closing for the night. In the deep cavernous silence the eternal red lamp showed before the figure of the virgin crown, while far beyond were the long candles burning before the altar with its many steps. The sight of those candles impelled the pious and enthusiastic Carlos to suggest that they should enter the church and there pray for the success of their plans. The deputy governor of Neva in the shabby straw hat smiled and at once agreed. In all Latin countries the lower class have a habit of kneeling before their favorite altar and craving blessings of the most paltry character. In Italy the contadini ask that the winning numbers of the lotto or government lottery may be revealed to them, or beg that their attempt at theft may be successful. In Spain they implore divine grace for a big catch of fish or a fat harvest, so that they may enrich themselves. Cupidity is at last the mainspring of most of the prayers of southern Europe. Garcia Zorilta, political adventurer and wire-puller, who by reason of his cunning and unscrupulousness had risen from clerk in a flour mill in Toledo to be deputy governor of the province of Neva, knew how pious was his friend, the young fisherman, and, mock piety being part of his profession, he was compelled to enter that great dark, over-ornamented church, and there kneel with his companion, before the altar. What Zorilta, one of the lieutenants of the great Contreras, prayed for, one does not know. But the prayer of Carlos the fisherman was for the speedy death of the one man he most greatly feared, the man to whom he had referred, as the Englishman. But as he rose from his knees, he whispered under his breath, Quando no pede uno vesterse la piel de leon basta se de la volteja when you cannot clothe yourself in the lion's skin put on that of the fox and a preface chapter one the evening shadows were falling softly as the earl of saxham stepped into one of the small drawing-rooms of that palatial residence ticehurst park in the county of sussex ticehurst park was a magnificent domain deeply mortgaged out of its fair revenues there were two or three heavily pensioned dowagers who had to be provided for, there were a heap of relations who had to draw their small annual stipends. On paper the Earl of Saxham was a very wealthy nobleman. When he had deducted the interest on mortgages and the yearly stipends and married settlements he was quite poor. Out of every sovereign he received he retained about ten shillings. A less even-tempered man would have cursed his bad luck that he should have been saddled with three dowagers and a host of other cormorants. Archibald, tenth Earl of Saxon, was a delightful optimist. He had come into the title by a series of fortunate accidents, and he was disposed to think that, on the whole, Providence had arranged things very agreeably. Before he took up the mantle of his father's he had been trying to make both ends meet, on a small private fortune of seven hundred a year, with but indifferent success. He had now those irksome deductions apart, several thousands a year, in fact a still very considerable income. He fitted into the position as easily as a glove. His wife, a woman of noble birth like himself, assisted him ably. They speedily became the most popular couple in Sussex, a county which boasts of many noble families. He came into his inheritance at the age of thirty, ten years after his beautiful and beloved wife died, leaving him with three children, Eric Viscount Tysers, Guy Rossett, and Mary Rossett. He was so devoted to the memory of his wife that he did not marry again. Mary Rossett, the youngest of the three, was sitting in the small drawing-room when he entered this particular evening. She was a handsome young woman of about twenty-five years, tall and slender. Her demeanor was a little staid, suggesting a woman some five years her senior. Truth to tell, 
Mary Rossett had experienced a bitter romance when she was at the age of twenty. Her heart was buried in the grave of a young officer of the guards who had died suddenly a few days before the date of their wedding. From that fatal day she had said good-bye to love, in a measure to youth. No other man would ever charm back the love-light into the eyes of Mary Rossett. But fate, which had stricken her so sorely, did not deprive her of her sweet and womanly qualities. She was the beloved companion of her brothers, the idol of her widowed father, and she was adored by all villagers on the estate, to many of whom she was often a ministering angel. The Earl of Saxham, as he entered the small drawing-room, was smiling in a peculiar manner. His daughter recognized that peculiar smile. Her father was very pleased with himself over something, but she knew what that something was. "'So Guy has come,' he cried cheerfully. "'Well, Mary, don't you give it away when he tells us the good news, or it will spoil it all.' Lady Mary rose and laid an affectionate hand on his arm. "'No need to caution me, dearest. You know I never give myself away. Keep a guard on yourself. Don't smile too much, or look at me too meaningly when he is telling us, or he'll spot it. You know you are a little indiscreet at times.' The Earl smiled genially. "'I know, I know, Mary. There is no fool like an old fool, they say. But this is really a great thing. I wrung it out of old Gratero, and once in Spain we shall get him out of the reach of that young minx, Isabel Clanton.' Mary's brows contracted into a slight frown. Love had left her stranded, but she was still very sympathetic to young lovers. "'Why are you so hard on poor Isabel, father?' she asked in her clear, kind voice. I know she is poor, but she is a lady and well-born. Her voice faltered a little as she added, Hugh was poor when you gave your consent that I should marry him. Why do you make this distinction with Guy? The Earl looked a little embarrassed. My dear Mary, you are a sensible girl, and you must see that the circumstances are totally dissimilar. Hugh was the younger son of a house as noble as our own. True, he was poor, but I could have helped you. And if you were ready to help me, you can help Guy and Isabel, flashed Lady Mary quickly. The Earl spoke a little irritably. It is very strange you can't see it. Isabel Clanton is, I admit, quite a lady in the technical sense of the term. But Guy must look beyond that. He must marry in his own rank. Failing that, he must marry a woman with money. Lady Mary spoke with an equal irritation. "'You are unjust, father, unjust both to Guy and Isabel. You have no right to ruin these two young lives with your prejudices and your old-world notions.' Her voice dropped into a half-sob as she concluded. "'What is there in the world better than real love? And these two love each other devotedly.' The Earl was about to reply angrily, for he was a somewhat obstinate old man, and hated being thwarted. But before he could utter a word, the door opened to admit Guy Rossett. Guy was a very handsome young fellow, with a winning and genial expression. He advanced and shook his father's hand warmly, and kissed his sister with equal affection. The Earl beamed upon him. Guy was his favorite of the two sons. Ticehurst was a languid young man about town, who did not appeal greatly to his more robust father. "'Well, Guy, my dear boy, delighted to see you. Have you brought us any news?' Mary shot a warning glance at her father. Lord Saxon was always preaching reticence to other people, but he never observed it himself. If Guy had been just a little more subtle than he was, he would have smelt a rat at once. Guy spoke in his frank, almost boyish voice. "'Splendid news, sir, but so good that I want to keep it to myself for a little bit. Shall we say till after dinner, when the servants have gone, and we are quite by ourselves? By all means, it was Mary's sweet, gentle voice that answered. I am sure I should like to keep very good news to myself for a time, hug it as it were. After dinner, Guy. Later on they went into the dining-room. The meal was a somewhat tedious and long repast. Lord Saxham, who was a bit of a gourmet, liked to take a small portion of several dishes. Guy was a hardy trencherman. Poor Lady Mary, whose thoughts inclined towards a convent, 
would have been satisfied with a cup of tea and a slice of bread and butter, but she had to preside over these prolonged meals. When the ponderous banquet, no lesser word could describe it, had drawn to a close, the footman withdrew. It was a family party. The two men sat round the table and smoked. Lady Mary waited to hear the great news, and then Guy unburthened himself. "'The biggest stroke of luck in the world, sir. After fooling about in the foreign office for all these years, Gretorix sent for me to go into his private room. A very short interview. Gretorix didn't waste words. I am to go to the embassy at Madrid.' Lady Mary preserved her sweet calm. The Earl did not move an eyelid. He lifted his glass of port. "'Success to you, my boy. You have got a chance now, and I am sure you will make good.' The young man drained his glass also. "'Yes, I think I shall make good. What I just wanted was a chance.' Mary shot a warning glance at her father. It was just on the cards that he might have blurted out something that would have hurt his son's pride, led him to understand that it was his father's secret influence that had got him this post. But fortunately at this stage the Earl's mental faculties were not very acute. He was already beginning to nod over his port. A few moments later Lord Saxham's somnolent faculties became more fully developed. Mary pointed to the terrace which was approached by the dining-room windows. She leaned across the table and whispered, "'Shall we take a stroll? I would like to talk all this over with you.' Guy nodded and rose. They went noiselessly to the terrace and sat down on one of the numerous seats overlooking the lovely gardens beneath. Mary opened the conversation at once. "'Is this, this good news, going to make any difference to you, Guy?' There was just a note of anxiety in her voice. Guy looked at her squarely. "'What do you mean, Mary? Difference in what way?' "'Difference between you and Isabel,' answered Mary in a voice that shook a little. You love each other so dearly. I would hate to think that anything could come between you. Guy laughed his hearty, boyish laugh. Dear old girl, you know I have always told the truth to you. I would sooner go to the devil with Isabel Clanton than to heaven with some delightful bride that our dear old dad had chosen for me. As soon as I am on my feet, Isabel will be my wife. Mary patted his hand affectionately. I am so delighted to hear you say that. But one never quite knows men. There is father in a way sentimental, but on certain things he can be as hard as granite. Guy Rossett frowned. Oh, I know, he hates the idea of my marrying Isabel. I suppose when I do he will forbid me the house and cut me off with a shilling, eh? Mary looked at him with a soft gleam in her kind, beautiful eyes. Oh, no, he will not do that, and if he wanted to, I should not let him. You know I have more influence over him than anybody. Except perhaps Ticehurst, suggested Guy in a tone that was not quite free from bitterness. He was not over fond of his elder brother. Mary shook her head. She was fond of both her brothers, but she was not oblivious of Ticehurst's faults. Don't worry about that, dear old boy. Eric has no influence over him at all, and when that dreadful deed is done, and Isabel is your wife, dear old dad will rage and fume and all that, but he will come round in the end and finish by loving Isabel as much as he does me. Don't worry. Go on with it. Guy kissed her. By Jove, you are a pal, Mary. Then I can count on you to back me up. Of course, was Mary's confident reply. There was silence between them for a little while, while Guy puffed at his cigarette, and his sister was cogitating as to her next method of attack. Brought up in a household of three men, she knew it was somewhat difficult to storm the masculine citadel. Presently she spoke. "'And what about finance, Guy? Are things easy there?' The boyish look disappeared from the young man's face. Her question had seemed to disturb his equanimity. He was quite frank. "'That's the devil of it, Mary.' You know my old friend Jackson? Mary gave a little sigh. Yes, she had heard of Jackson from both brothers. He was a high-class money-lender who accommodated young men of good family. Yes, I know all about Jackson. How much do you owe him? Her brother reflected. 
"'Something between five and six hundred, he said, after a pause. Mary spoke decidedly. "'You must clear that off before you go to Spain. You must have a clean sheet.' She reflected also, before she spoke again. "'I can let you have two hundred and fifty out of what I have saved.' Guy interrupted. "'You sweet little soul, you never spend anything except in charities.' "'I know,' answered his sister quietly. "'Anyway, there is my two hundred and fifty, and I must coax the rest out of Dad. You must go to Spain with a clean sheet. That is absolutely essential.' Guy answered with his boyish laugh and with his boyish exuberance. "'It is too awfully dear and kind of you, and you can guess how I appreciate it. But I am not going to let my sister waste her money on two graceless scamps like Ticehurst and myself, and I don't sponge on my father, either. Mary protested gently. Oh, Guy, how unjust of both yourself and Eric! You know that is not my opinion of either of you. Guy took her slender hand in his own. You dear old girl, you are only just a little bit lower than the angels. You have always had wings growing since you were a wee toddler. But I am going to see this thing through on my own. Jackson is an old scoundrel, of course, but he never presses one very hard. I shall square him all right. Mary said no more on the subject. Both her brothers inherited the paternal obstinacy. When they had once made up their minds, nothing could move them. But she sighed a little. It would have been so much better if Guy could have got rid of this odious money-lender and have landed in Spain with a clean sheet. He would have been free from any pecuniary worries, and therefore in a better mood to attend to his work. Jackson was done with. But there was another subject which she wanted to broach before this interview was ended, and it was a rather delicate one. It was some little time before she spoke again. "'And how about that woman, Violet Hargrave? Are you quite clear of her? It is not fair to Isabel that you should keep up even a semblance of friendship with such an odious person.' Guy laughed, but this time his laugh did not ring clear and boyish. It betrayed uneasiness. "'Oh, come, Mary, you are a bit uncharitable, aren't you? Violet Hargrave is generally considered a charming, not an odious person.' His sister spoke a little sternly for her. "'I don't pretend to have a man's knowledge of the world, but I have not been brought up in a nursery. I know her type, and it is one from which any pure woman and any decent man ought to shrink. Have you given her up?' Guy looked her squarely in the face. "'Honestly, Mary, I have, just after I met Isabel. Of course, a man can't throw a woman over in a second, but I have cooled down gradually. At the present moment I think the fascinating widow hates me. Mary rose and spoke decidedly. "'I am glad to have your assurance of that. If it had not been so, I might have felt it my duty to warn Isabel. She is too sterling a girl to be played with.' Her brother rose, too, half resentful, half admiring. It was not the first time that Lady Mary had spoken salutary words of wisdom to him. "'By Jove, Mary, you are uncompromising. Do you mean to say you would give me away to Isabel?' me your own brother of course answered mary firmly to isabel or any other woman if i thought you were unworthy of her admiration conquered he tucked her arm in his as they returned to the house you dear old girl you are one out of a million but you know you are a little uncomfortable at times and when you are inclined that way you have a knack of making a fellow feel a bit of a worm mary laughed pleasantly so good for you feeling that dear old boy, and equally good for Eric. I expect Dad is woken up by now and wondering where we have got to. They found the Earl wide awake. The doze of a few minutes over his port had refreshed him immensely. He fell at once to discussing Spain, a country he knew well. In his youth Lord Saxon had been an attaché at the Spanish court, and he knew the ropes. Guy listened respectfully to his father. The old man concluded his somewhat rambling remarks with a final exhortation. "'And remember, my dear boy, always to keep on the right side of Gatorex. He is the foreign office. Secretaries, mere figureheads, come and go with different governments. Gatorex remains there, permanent, unchangeable. Get into his good graces, and your fortune is made.' 
Guy promised that he would do his best to propitiate the all-powerful Gratorex. Two days later he left. He undertook to pay them a farewell visit before he started for Spain. The earl and his daughter watched the car flying down the avenue. The old man turned to his daughter with a grunt. "'Might have given us another couple of days, I think. But I know what's in his mind. He is running down to Eastbourne after that minx. He always alluded to Isabel Clandon as that minx, owing to his unreasonable prejudice against her. Mary spoke with spirit very natural under the circumstances i should think he would want to see something of the girl he loves before he left lord saxon turned on her angrily mary i have always thought you a sensible woman do you mean to tell me you are going to aid and abet him in his folly lady mary answered him in a few words i don't call it folly father she walked out of the room with a resolute expression on her face and uplifted chin she would have been the last to admit it but she had inherited no small share of the family obstinacy. End of chapter one. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com.